With that, Gary, I'm giving you the floor. Okay, thank you, Steve. Um, welcome, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here talking with you all. And I'm going to start with an outline of what we're going to be covering today. First, we're going to look at, at the big picture of what is the semantic web and why do we need it and why would we want to have something like federation and what do we mean by federation anyways. And then I'm going to talk about part of, of this whole issue is this opportunity of having all of these wonderful data sources out there and how we can work with them. And what federation does is that it helps us scale so we can work with this, this, these massive amounts of data and these different data sources. And it helps us manage the data that we have. And it helps us warehouse that data so that we can keep, uh, keep running as we accumulate billions upon billions of triples. Finally, I'm going to talk about some of the specifics of Allegro Graphs Federation capabilities. And then I'll end with a short demonstration of what Federation looks like in Allegro Graphs and how simple it is to use. So with that, we'll get started. Um, so there we go. We're on the first topic. So I assume that everyone here knows what we mean when we talk about the semantic web and web 2.0 and moving towards web 3.0. Part of the, the whole allure of the semantic web and of the web in general is that there's all these, these sources of information out there distributed all over the world and growing all the time. And we want to make use of all this creative energy this international creative energy, and be able to combine this knowledge in new ways to produce new services. So we've all seen the different mashups that Google Maps or Craigslist has made possible. We now see things like Facebook applications and applets uh, burgeoning out. So there's just a, a ton of exciting, sometimes silly, but often very useful new tools that are coming into being as this data becomes more and more important. Secondly, at the enterprise level, we've got companies with huge amounts of investment in their own private databases. And sometimes those databases are stuck in one little dusty corner of the enterprise. And semantic technologies should be a way that we can air out those corners and get the knowledge flowing to the right place when it needs to be there, so that knowledge is shared in the enterprise, and that helps them be more nimble. So those are some of the, the reasons why I believe we want the semantic web to be a success. So federation is a large part of this, a large part of what I think will make the semantic web successful, because We've got this data all over the place, and it comes in different shapes, different kinds, and all sorts of different ontologies that don't necessarily mesh up very well. And when we have all this data, we have to have some way to scale as we load the data into our systems and as we track the different sources of data and its provenance and what we can and cannot trust, and as data gets old, we don't necessarily want to throw it away because we, we've invested a lot of time and effort in getting it into a form that we can use. So we need good ways of archiving that data so that we can still go back and look at it whenever we need to. So in Allegro Graph, just to be clear, the, the federation we're talking about is an organization, an organization of triple stores within a larger triple store. So we want to have small pieces, even where these small pieces may be billions of triples, loosely joined together into a larger triple store. So our federation is about transparently integrating many different sources of data into a single triple store that can be treated <coughs> uniformly. So we're not talking about semantic mediation, which is a very hard problem. And that's all about um, knowing how to map 
from one ontology to another. And because many of the triple stores out there don't necessarily have very well-designed ontologies, that makes it even more difficult. And also, our federation is more than just a Sparkle endpoint, more than just a place that you can run queries against. That is an important source of the power of the web and the power of the semantic web, is that we can go out and do these queries uh, where we need, where the data lives. But we're more interested in having this transparent data integration where you can do all the sorts of things you want to do on your data, uh, not, just, not just querying. So what the Allegra Graph Federation allows is building these loosely coupled RDF stores dynamically, on the fly. Uh, you can pull triple stores in and, and take them out of the federation as you need to. And this helps us manage the, the data ingesting process, loading the data into our triple stores. It helps us manage all the data sources that we have, and it helps us manage the data over time. And probably the most important point is that this federated triple store we have implements all of the Allegra Graph interfaces. So we can use all the tools that we have, uh, social networking analysis, geospatial reasoning, temporal queries, range queries, the usual Sparkle, Prolog, all of these things work transparently across the federation. So I'm going to look in a little more detail at why we need the federation in terms of the amount of data that's out there and how that's growing over time. Um, I think many people have probably seen this slide from Nova Spivak, where we've got, we're sort of in the web 2.0 range and we're moving very quickly into the web 3.0 range and we see all these, these nice acronyms and technologies that are growing. And with each new set of acronyms, we also build a whole new set of knowledge sources and data sources. And all of that is just providing exponential growth in the amount of, of triples that we're going to need to deal with over time. Um, so all of that, the, the actual RDF stores and all the data that can be converted into RDF stores and those are showing up in more and more places as the semantic web catches on. And each of those individual stores is also getting bigger. So we've got triples everywhere. And the question is, how can we scale our tools to actually make use of all, these, all this data? But it doesn't do us any good to have billions and billions of triples if we can't load them in quickly enough and analyze them quickly enough. Otherwise, we're just playing catch-up, and, and the web won't be the value that it, that it needs to be. So let's look at the data ingest process. The Lubum benchmark, the Lehigh University benchmark, is relatively famous in the semantic web world. It's, if you're not familiar with it, it's a model of an artificial university with students and departments, professors, classes, all of those things. It's a highly regular data set, so it doesn't have to worry about all the complexities of the messy real world, but it does still make a great test bed for comparing different RDF engines and reasoning tools. And it can be set at lots of different levels. The so Lubum 50 has, if I recall correctly, around 50 million triples, and that's a nice small data set that you can fool around with. And then if you want to, you can scale all the way up to Lubum 8000 or larger. I mean, Lubum 8000 has a billion triples in it, more than a billion triples in it. So we need to be able to, to pull that in quickly. Um, and I'm going to look at two scenarios of loading Lubum 8000 with Allegro Graph. So in one scenario, I'm going to take my single machine, I've got four CPUs and multiple disks and lots of memory. It's a good, powerful machine. And I'm going to set it to loading Lubum 8000 and preparing all the indices so we can do querying. And we're just going to run that, run that along uh, as a single, large, triple store. 
And we can use the use the CPUs. We're, we'll be making use of all four. Whoops, sorry about that. All four CPUs to to do the indexing in the background as we do the loading. So we're making making good use of the CPU architecture. Now the second, I'm going to take exactly the same machine, but instead of doing everything in one CPU, I'm going to split the data set into four triple stores and load those separately, load and index those separately, and then federate that all together into a single virtual federated triple store. So Allegra Graph 3.0 can build all of Ubuntu 8000 in about 24 hours, about a day. That's with the unified store. Now, if we throw, uh, if, we, if we instead build the federated store, we can load the whole thing in about eight hours, eight hours and 20 minutes. So that's a really wonderful speed up. And in fact, if we can throw more and more CPUs at it and get almost a linear speed up in load time. So I'm going to talk more about that in the next couple slides. The one thing you see here is this is a graph over time where the bottom axis is seconds and the y-axis is the percent. And I've got the user time in green and the system time in, in blue and the I.O. wait time in red. So here we, we start loading Lubum 8000 right about time zero. And you can see we're making good use. This is for the federated load. So each CPU is running and loading as quickly as it can the triples. And you can see that we're making good use of the CPU um, in our user space. The system's having to do some work as well. Um, but the disk I.O. Is, is quite low. So we're mostly just reading and writing triples here um, as we go. And we get up to this point, and the load is just about done, and then we start indexing. So you can see that um, the system time is really thrashing around a lot more, and we've got a lot more I.O. wait time. And then the third phase here is when we're actually merging all these indices together, which um, it, is a very expensive operation. We're doing lots and lots of reading and writing, and we're really hammering the hard disks. So you can see that the the issue here is not so much CPU as it is uh, as it is making efficient use of the hard drives. So that's that's a real great opportunity to even improve our load speeds even more. Um, and all we need to do to increase or to decrease the total time is add more CPUs and more disks. So the more powerful the computer we have, the faster we can do this. So the one question you should be having is, um, what's the catch? Because I've said that by using federated loading, I can load Lubum roughly as fast as I want to if I have enough money to buy a really super machine. So. What the downside is, when I'm done, if I've used just a unified triple store, then I've got one triple store in one place. And when I make a query against it, I know exactly where to go and look for the triples that I need, because they're all in the same exact spot. So it's a very easy, easy question to answer. If I've federated the triple store, then I've got something that lives in lots of different places. And when I do a query, I've got to run to all of those places and look for the triples in them. So it's definitely more work for, for query when you have a federation. So I'm just going to do a, one simple query. I'll show you some timings um, so that you'll know what, what we're talking about. It's uh, one of the queries from the Lubin benchmark. And it uh, basically says, find me all of the graduate students who take course zero at university zero and department zero. So I just want to grab all of those, uh, find the distinct ones, and I'm going to get back their, their, their name as string. So here's the query again. And you can see for the unified store, 
The first run is, of course, going to take more because I'm going to be reading a lot of the indices for the first time and pulling things off the disk and into, into cache. So the first query, it takes me about 1.4 seconds. And after that, the next runs are, are very, very fast, just two milliseconds. I can run that query as many times as I want. And I should, I should mention that with the Lumen data set that, that I'm using, because of the random C that it was built with, we pull back eight triples. Um, now, with the federated store, we get exactly the same answer, because it's the same data. Um, and it takes all about twice as long. The first run, we've got to go to those four places and find those things. So it takes about three and a half seconds. And thereafter, it's, it's four milliseconds. So there is a cost for federation. But it's not much. It's really quite cheap to do this extra work. And that's a great thing, because federated loading scales very well, because there's almost no contention between the different CPUs as they do their work. The only issue would be uh, for things like blank nodes, because I've got to make sure that the blank nodes in one triple store don't step on blank nodes in another one, because they don't want to unify things by accident. But that's not really a problem, because um, of the way that RDF works is each individual RDF or OWL file is a little feast and to itself. And so we won't have blank nodes that show up in more than one file. And since we're loading these triples one file at a time, there's no contention on blank nodes, and, and we can really make use of all of our CPUs. And another advantage of this is that a lot of sorting algorithms, sorting and merging algorithms, are growing as, as order n, log n, or at least as log n. And so reducing the total number of triples in a given store helps to parallelize that process as well. So it's easy to imagine that we could load a billion triples over a long lunch break. So let's move on now and look at how Federation helps us to scale how does Federation help us manage our data? Well, in a real enterprise or even small business world, uh, data is coming from all over the place. We'll have data that comes uh, from internal sources and external sources. We'll have data that's been inferred from one or another ontology or from a set of rule engines. We'll have data that describes the data and the provenance. We'll have different ontologies you want to work with. We'll have data that describes which triples have been deleted or are no longer important. So if I have to put all of those different sorts of things into the same triple store, it starts to get messy to deal with it all. Things like named graphs help, but we still have all of this data in one place. And it kind of runs into itself. Now if I have federation instead, then I can easily make a data set, a triple store, that has exactly the, the sources that I want. I could take, for example, a set of known facts, and by using federation, I can use different ontologies to see what can be inferred from those facts. And in the same way, I could take the same ontology and plug it into different sets of facts to see how different sets of facts work under different ontologies. I can do all of that now without federation, but federation makes it really easy. And it means that I don't have to keep duplicating my data. I can have each piece like a Lego block that I can easily plug together and take apart. And the advantage of this is that uh, as we're doing querying, as a human, we know that obviously I don't need to look in the ontology triple store to find ground triples, because the ontology triple store won't have that. Well, our query optimizers can, can easily learn where to look for triples based on caching and based on predicates and other uh, inference that we, that we can provide. And that means that they'll go even faster because they'll be running over smaller subsets of the triple stores. So the 
the next big advantage of federation is that it provides a really easy warehousing solution. So we can imagine many, many uh, scenarios where we'll have tremendous amounts of data coming in every day. Um, could be call volumes, uh, transactions, uh, web page search statistics, anything like that. And we'll be getting a lot of data each day, perhaps billions of triples each day. And we want to be able to grow this indefinitely. But as we, as we continue to grow our data sets, we clearly start to bog down just in terms of the number of hard disks that we need online and the amount of CPU and process it takes to, to uh, query and scan that all. So what we can do with Federation is very, very easily start a new triple store, say, every month. And then when it's the first of the month, all we need to do is build a new triple store that's going to take the new data coming in and take one of the older triple stores offline and save it somewhere else. So we can migrate that to tertiary storage. And as far as the Federation is concerned, everything just keeps acting and looking the same. It's very, very simple for people at the, at the higher levels to just continue doing their queries as they've always done them. And we can just easily rotate, it's like a rotating log, we easily are just rotating triple stores in and out as we go and as we need to. And if there's ever a case where we need to go back, that's equally simple because we just need to pull the old triple store out of storage, dust it off, and stick it into the Federation, and all that data is instantly becomes available again. So now I want to talk about a few of the details of Allegro Graphs Federation technology, just at a very high level so that you'll have a better idea of what sort of things we can federate. And how that will work today and in the future. So this is a, a class diagram. Some of the names are a, a little funny sounding because they're actually the names that are in the code. And uh, as is typical of class diagrams, every triple store inherits from this abstract triple store. And that means that they're all going to obey more or less the same interfaces. Some of the triple stores down lower add capabilities, but all triple stores share in, in whatever an abstract triple store gives them. So the main kinds of triple store that inherit from an abstract, abstract triple store are this concrete triple store. And by concrete, we mean that it's storing real, actual triples. And, and they're sort of physically located in my machine. Now, those may be in-memory triples. Uh, if I'm just doing something short-term and I don't need to persist it, then I can just keep everything in memory so it's very fast um, and very easy to, to work with. Um, or I can make it a persistent triple store. So this, this triple store, I, mean, I know I'm saving these triples to disk. And It'll be slower because I've got to deal with writing and reading disks and disk I.O., but it will be more secure. So that's what I'm going to use for most of my triple stores unless I'm just fooling around and running some, some what-if scenarios. Now, the, the triple store that Allegro Graph uses internally is called triple DB, and that's the one that, that has all of the Allegro Graph uh, capabilities built in and it's sort of what comes out of the Lego Graph 2.0 as it gets plugged into this larger framework. So those are that's the, the persistent sort triples that live right where I am on my hard drive. I'm going to skip over federated for now, and we'll move to an encapsulated triple store. Now that's a triple store that wraps around another triple store. Um, adding some sort of capability in the process. So right now, the only wrapping triple store we have is a reasoning triple store. So that means that I'm, I'm taking a regular triple store, say some in-memory or, or persistent triple store, 
with a bunch of triples in it, and I want to do reasoning on it. And I have several different reasoners to choose from, and I can mix and match those as necessary. So to do that, I take my regular triple store, and I wrap it in a reasoning triple store, and because the interfaces are the same, I use the same sort of queries, but now the reasoning kicks in when I ask a query, and I'll get inferred triples as well as ground triples out. And obviously, I can, I can nest this as much as I want. I can have one reasoning triple store that does RDFS++ reasoning, another one that's doing some sort of swirl inference and rule-based reasoning. Um, it can get as, as complicated as you need to solve the problem that you want to solve. And the nice thing about that is that no matter how complicated these layers of encapsulation become, the interface to query remains the same. The interface to use any of the other social networking tools or geospatial reasoning, temporal reasoning, that all stays the same. It's just a matter of setting up your triple store within this framework. Now suppose you want to work with triples that aren't on your hard disk. They're somewhere else. Well, that's what we call a remote triple store. So any server out there that implements the Allegro Graph remote triple store interface can play in this world. Um, right now, the only uh, server that implements the full interface is Allegro Graph itself. So you can have Allegro Graph servers running anywhere in the world, and using federation, you can use those triple stores with your local triple stores, and obviously there's some cost to pay for network bandwidth and, and moving data over the wire, but we do a lot of caching to speed that up and make it not such a big problem um, so that you can work with remote data and do all the cool stuff I've been talking about with, with it just like it was local to you. Now, in the next quarter, we're going to be adding uh, a Sesame interface, so we'll be able to use Sesame triple stores within the Allegro Graph Federation, and also Oracle triple stores within the same federation. So then we'll be able to tie in uh, even more interesting forms of data that, that are out, door, out there and plug them all together. And it, it's actually very exciting that that as more uh, as we pull more and more different external sources into this framework, uh, fairly it, it becomes fairly easy to combine all of this and get some really wonderful power for not too much effort. And finally, I left out this federated triple store here, so it's possible to, to have really interesting looking federations where you may have some federation that includes some of your own local triple stores and some remote triple stores. And some of those remote triple stores may be federated themselves. So they have their own complicated structure. And some of those, some of those remote triple stores may be encapsulated and have their own reasoning going on. And you may combine them together and add other reasoning on top of that. So you can have this wonderful sort of spaghetti triple stores tied together in, in whatever way makes sense for the problem at hand. And Allegro Graph will let you manage all that so that you can just worry about your queries. And Allegro Graph will take care of the details. So, so finally, now that I've talked about all that, I want to show you what Allegro Graph in Federation looks like. So, we're going to federate together three very different triple stores. Um, and I'll talk about each one in case you haven't, didn't know they were out there or haven't heard of them. They're all really wonderful data sets um, with a lot of work has gone into them, into uh, taking and managing the data and converting it from it's a non-triple format, non-RDF format, into formats that you can use in um, in a triple store. So we're going to work with the DBpedia and the GeoNames triple store and the US census, census data. So let's look at each of those. Uh, the DBpedia, for those that aren't familiar with it, is a community effort 
to take all of the structured information that's in the Wikipedia and turn it into a form that you can use um, using the semantic web. So the Wikipedia is, is structured and semi-structured, but it's not in a form that, that you can pull into triples very easily. So DBpedia takes the, that information and lets you um, link it with other data sets and lets you ask much more sophisticated queries than simple text indexing. And right now, the, the version 3, which was just released uh, a week or two ago, has about 218 million triples in it. Um, so it's fairly large. Now, the US Census data, excuse me, the US Census data comes from the Census Bureau, and it has this really sort of interesting, complicated format that actually begs to be used in a graph database like an RDF store. Because there's all of these different tables, and each of those tables point into other tables, and those may point into other subtables. And so it's very graph-like. And at the bottom, you end up with actual numbers. And what the number means is, whoops, what the number means is determined by the path you took to get there. So this is a, just a sample from Joshua Taberer's website um, that shows, for example, that I'm looking at uh, this number down here, this 3,000. I see how I got there was by looking at uh, age 10 to 19. This would be a blank node. And then I go up to find males. So that's males 10 to 19 that are in this population from this region. So you can see that um, it takes some work to understand the data and to actually figure out the path that you want to take in order to, to get the numbers that you're looking for. So finally, oops, I keep hitting my mouse wheel. Sorry about that. Finally, uh, we've got the GeoNames database. So that's another wonderful source of information that is full of uh, 8 million different geographical names. So this is cities and towns, road networks, famous places, rivers, lakes, streams, mountains, all the things that, that you think of when you think about, when you look around the world and you want to name something. And each of these different names uh, contains information about where it is, how high it is, um, what it is, different feature codes. And all told, um, I, feel like I, just, I didn't write down the number of triples that are actually in there. Um, and I don't know off the top of my head. 110 million. How many, Jan? 110 million. 110 million. So again, another large triple source. So these three triple stores together give us um, about 1.2 billion triples in all. So. Let's look at the sort of queries we could ask if we, if we federated all of these things together. So because it's the uh, presidential season in America, we'll, we'll start with a presidential query. So we could wonder where Barack Obama was born. And that's something that we could find in the DBpedia. He's, he's going to be in the DBpedia. We can look there, and we can find out where he was born, and then we could for example, use geonames to look at all of the cities and towns that are close to his birthplace, within 10 miles of his birthplace, for example. And that will give us latitude and longitude information. And we could use that then to go into the census triple store and learn, for example, what the average poverty level of these places is in the year 2000. Um, the census data is obviously for a particular year. And the data set we have right now is the year 2000 census. Um, so let's now, I'm going to shift to do a demonstration. And so what I've got here is um, a shell window into, uh, into a computer running at Franz. And I've, I started Allegro Graph, but I haven't really done anything else. So this, I'm, I'm running this all within Lisp. 
and I'm going to start by um, loading. I'm going to take this code that I've written, and I'm going to copy it and paste it in here, and you'll see it all execute quickly like that. So the, um, the main part of the code is right here. I'm opening three triple stores. And then I'm going to federate them together. So I do that. I just open each triple store by giving its place where it lives. And then I make a federated triple store with the name fed. And I just list the triple stores that need to go into that. And then to make some, some of the queries easier down the road, I've got all of these different namespaces from the different triple stores that um, I want to use. So I'm going to actually do that by, by calling the function run setup and it's going out and it's opening the triple stores, opening the triple store indices, looking up the string dictionaries and combining them all together and um, it took about seven seconds to do that. And now I've got triple stores that I can use and query. So I'm also going to define a few helper functions here to make it a little simpler to print and, uh, and get triple out of these, these stores. So we'll do those three. Um, just to show you, the triple store I have right now is a federated triple store. And it has three substores in it. And we can look at its triple count. So indeed, it has about the comma, it's hard to read that off, but it's 1,326,000,000 triples in it. So that's accumulated from the, the three places, the DBpedia, the census data, and the GeoNames triple store. So now let's, um, let's go through sort of where, I, where I, what we were talking about by looking for Barack Obama. So I want to, um, I'm going to do get triples. The GTS is just short for get triples list. And the subject I want is uh, Barack Obama. And in the DBpedia, names are separated with underscores like that. So this, uh, I just went out and ran a query. I found all of the triples whose subject is DBpedia Barack Obama. And I have pulled them back and printed them. So you can see we've got uh, triples in different languages. Um, we have links to uh, photo collections. We can see that, uh, his religion um, in different languages. His alma mater was Columbia. Um, and we can learn a lot of interesting things. Now, we in particular were interested where he was born. And this is one of the places where uh, the Wikipedia is a little less than ideal because there are lots and lots of different predicates in the Wikipedia that all mean more or less the same thing. And it's not clear which one you actually want to use for a given subject in the, in the, uh, in the DBpedia. So uh, we can look at all the different predicates and we see things like birth home, birth place, place birth, place of birth, different capitalizations, and um, I'm just going to go through each of these, and I'm going to try and get a triple whose subject is Barack Obama and whose predicate is one of these predicates, and then um, if I found one, then I'll print it out. Gary? Yes? Um, and what you're not telling me is that, and then this is also the case for 20 different languages, so it's even worse than you're saying right now. That's right. I narrowed it down to English for, my, for myself. Okay. <laughs> so we'll run that. And again, you can see how quickly we're, we're querying that, that 1.3 billion triple store asking for particular triples. And um, the, the answer, of course, is always the last place you look. So I find that for Barack Obama, at least, the predicate I want is uh, place of birth. And we see that he was born in uh, this resource, DBpedia Hawaii. And 
then we come to another kind of complicated thing because I know that I've, I've got this federated store and I also know that um, geonames and uh, the census database aren't going to have a resource called DBpedia Hawaii in them, but at least it's very unlikely. So I need to figure out how to look for a particular triple that I want. So in this case, I'm going to do a print triple, and I don't care about the subject or the object uh, predicate, but I want the object to be a literal that is Hawaii. So we'll see what we get back. Um, so now I've gone again, I've gone out to the three triple stores, looked in all three of them, and I see I've pulled back one that looks like it's from uh, the census database, given the, given the subject, and that, whatever this is, has the title Hawaii. And then I also see two triples that look like they're from geonames that have uh, an ASCII name and a name of Hawaii, and they're from the same blank node, which is this, this right here. Um, so let's uh, now do something even a little more interesting. I'm going to take this Sparkle query here. So we set up some prefixes. And this actually asks, it doesn't ask for the poverty level, it asks for the, the median income in 1999. So from, from the sample of the data. So I'm going to look at the median income uh, from the 2000 census for the population who's 15 years and older that actually had an income. So I'm excluding people with no income at all. And I'm going to do all of this looking for uh, counties, U.S. Gov County, that are part of Hawaii. So um, we're using this bit here that tells us the state that we're working with and we're going to pull that in here and make the query there and we're going to take all these and order them by median income so this is a nice fairly interesting and complicated sparkle query that we can run on our federated store um, so this will go off and uh, as you can see it's, it's hardly any time at all, about a quarter of a second, and we found these uh, five different counties, and we can see that the median income for each of them ranged from 8750 all the way up to 28450 So that's an example. One thing that's important to note here is that I never had to worry about where the data was coming from. I didn't have to tell Allegra Graph, look for these triples in the GeoNames database and look for these triples in the DBpedia. I just ask Allegra Graph the questions and it does all the work of going out and looking in the federated triple store and pulling back the answers. So it makes using the data much more simple than if I had to keep switching from one triple store to another and worrying about where the data was coming from. I can just work with the data as one unified whole. So, uh, uh, Gary? Yes, John? Can you go to the France website and then to the Learning Center? Yes, good idea. Because, I mean, we've been doing this demonstration in LISP because it's e easier to do it in the demonstration uh, interactively. But actually, um, if you go to our website, you will find um, a whole Java website with tutorials. And once 3.0 comes out uh, this quarter, um, it will have all the examples that you saw now in, uh, in Java format. So here. As John just said, we have many, many uh, small examples that run from uh, downloading and installing a Liker graph through loading triples into it, through doing reasoning, uh, 
with different predicates um, and sparkle and all 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 the sort of different bits and pieces of things you need to know how to do with triples. And, and um, by the way, this could be much length, but that's one of the things that will be filled in once three the load comes out this quarter. This is a this is a really great resource uh, for understanding both RDF and the semantic web and understanding Allegro graphs in particular. Um, okay, that's all I wanted to show, Gary. Yes. So that actually is right. That was all I wanted to say. And the summary is that Allegro Graph Federation lets you manage your triples seamlessly. So you can you can load a billion triples over lunch, manage that data flexibly, from manage data from many different sources flexibly, and manage that data over time. And you can use all of the tools that are out there with the Federation transparently. So I really appreciate your attention. And uh, if you have any questions now, please ask them. And if you have follow-up questions after this webinar, you can contact Steve Sears at Fron. And his email address is right there on the slide. So thank you very, very much. OK, thanks, Gary. <coughs> um, We've been uh, trying to stay on top of the questions that have been coming in as they come in. Um, there's one question I just want to make sure that I answer correctly. Uh, the machine configuration that you were running the Lumen 8000 uh, tests on, um, I said that was a four CPU, 1.8 gigahertz, a four CPU, 1.8 gigahertz with uh, 16 gig of RAM uh, AMD processors running Linux. Was that correct? Okay. Um, so, let's look at the other questions. Some other questions. Um, Questions about the objects and relational. So one question that we saw was, um, is it also possible to put relational databases in the federation and treat them as if they are uh, an RDF database? And the answer to that is no, we don't do that yet. But we are working on uh, data importers so that we make it very, very easy to import data from relational databases, not entirely automatic because the human being also always has to make some decisions, uh, but then we can uh, uh, in, at least ingest from uh, relational databases. Um, for programmers, it's very easy to do it already now, but we need some more user-friendly tools uh, so that more people can easily uh, ingest data. Um, and in addition to that, there are some tools out there on the market already that allow uh, you to look at an RDF database as if it were, sorry, at, at a relational database as if it were an RDF store. And we're looking right now into how we can put those tools in the middle of our process so we can put it into the federation. There's two here. OK. Why was he able to, can I see, why was he able to load those remote update databases so quickly? Well, because they're all in our data warehouse. So all the databases were on our machines, uh, in our machine room on the same network. So that's why it was done so fast. Here's one. What's the next one? I, I want to add one little bit to that, what you just said. Uh, the high speed was because they're really all all um, nearby on the same network, very close to us. But even if they were remote, the actual opening wouldn't take much longer because all we would need to do is, is send an open command to the remote triple store, wherever it is, and it would be able to open it quite quickly because 
the remote triple source server is going to be living close to its data and then send back an acknowledgement. The queries would, would take longer because we'll be sending the triples over a longer pipe. But the actual opening and using and, and, and that sort of thing is still going to be quite fast. Okay. Um, there are a lot of questions. What language do you use to operate on the triple store? Well, I think we handle that just by telling people that there uh, uh, is a full uh, Java interface to our triple store, a Sesame interface, um, and everything you can do, you can also do in Java. And there's also the REST protocol. And then we have an HTTP interface to our databases. So actually with, within every language you can uh, access our database. Um, again, if there are other questions that come to mind after after the seminar, uh, my email address is sears.france.com. Um, feel free to send questions. Okay, then I guess we uh, can end this uh, webinar. Thank okay. you all for your attention. Okay, again, thank you all for attending. Um, we're, we'll be putting up some new seminars um, in the near future, new topics. Um, when I send out the survey, uh, we, we do appreciate your feedback. Uh, we're you know, bringing different uh, presenters into the program now, and uh, you know, feedback is very important to help us uh, you know, do a better job in the, in the next, next event. So um, again, you can email me questions uh, you know, if you think of them later. I'll be sending out a uh, notification when we have this presentation uh, recorded and posted up on, this, on, the, on the website. It will be located at the same place where you um, registered for the seminar. And uh, again, Gary, thank you very much. That was very enlightening. Yes, thank you very much. Goodbye, all. <laughs>